We are, as always, happy that you are here this morning. We get the honor and privilege of, uh, we're going to sing happy birthday and anniversary to those who have birthdays and baptismal birthdays and anniversaries. Uh, we'll also uh, begin a new study on the miracle of Jesus walking on water. Those are back there for the adults. But first, let's start with a prayer. We thank you, dear God, that you've given us another day. We are grateful for every time we can get out of bed and say, He is risen. He is risen indeed. We are grateful for this opportunity to know you and to spend this time together. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So let's take a look at our list today. I think I saw quite a few names on there. All right. We got some birthdays to celebrate for Kelly and Claudine and David. And Eileen all have birthdays coming up. Coming up. So if you'd like to sing with me, we'll sing the birthday song. Thanks for our friends who celebrate. Anniversaries for Scott and Heather Daniels. Wonderful, wonderful. Let's sing the anniversary song. Thanks for two friends who celebrate. Yet one more year in this estate. Praise God who made their flesh unite. Praise to the Lord for this divine. And we have some baptismal birthdays for Dale and Janelle. So let's sing the baptismal birthday song. Thanks for our friends who celebrate another year you consecrate. Praise God who baptized them below. Praise to the Lord, his church to grow. Amen. Okay. This time we'll dismiss our Sunday school and Sunday school kiddos and teachers. The rest of us who are staying here, I do have a new uh, handout or outline if you'd like to follow along with us, but we're in Matthew chapter 14, Matthew chapter 14, beginning at verse 22, Matthew 14, beginning at verse 22. <laughs> Can't swim, can he? Yeah. <coughs> Matthew 14. I hey, appreciate yeah. you remembering that. Thank you. I heard one of my one of my jokes in a sermon this weekend at the LWML convention. That's where I was the last two days up in Overland Park with 18, 19, 16 of our ladies up there. Had a good time. Got home last night about 11:30, 11:45. So I am bright eyed, but I don't think my tail is bushy today. <laughs> barely bright. Still working on my coffee. It was a good time. Had a real uh, good, great speakers. I got to participate in the opening service to help uh, serve communion with the other pastors. It was over 350 to 400 people or so. Uh, it was great. It was wonderful. Your mom made it. My mom made it. Yeah. Awesome. She went with us. I think she overslept. So. She'll be here for church. We won't put that on camera. Sorry. Off the off the. She texted me and said, "I overslept. I'll see you at church." Okay. So they will all be traveling home today, and so today for our music, uh, we have some guitar players that are going to play for us. 
Um, so we're going to do that. We're actually kind of like the, the man service today. Yeah. Right? The women's are kind of all the, everybody who's going to help or do anything today are men. We are men today. So that's what we're doing. Um, anybody else? Anything else? Are you folks driving in California? What's that? Are you driving or are you flying? Who? You folks should go to California. Oh, my mom is leaving Tuesday to fly back to California. Fly back. Yes. Actually, my wife is going with her. Really? Yeah, my wife's leaving me. Oh. <laughs> should I just stop there or should I keep going? No. Oh, my. She's flying back to California with my mom to I go to a funeral for a great aunt. And then my daughter Anna has prom. Yeah. And then um, she has a choir concert that Jennifer gets to go to. So she'll be gone for a few weeks. <laughs> so it'll be a Joe and I in the man house. All right. <laughs> be careful and humble. Start rumors, they go fast. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I kept going. Yeah. <laughs> My wife is leaving for a few weeks. So if okay. you don't see her now, you know that it's on camera. But I, don't, I think she's coming back. She's supposed to come back yeah. in May. God willing. And then we're going back in uh, June, or the end of May and June. I put a little blurb in the newsletter um, about that if you got a chance to read that. But when we go to California to get the rest of our stuff and all of that. Anybody else? Okay, let's take a look at your paper. We have been talking about miracles, something only God can do, something that could be um, not explained by human minds. We just have to be able to take it on who God is and what he's able to do. And the reasons he does some miracles is to help us understand him better. Let's just we'll go with that. He helps some people. Did he help everybody? We don't know, but you got to imagine the amount of requests that he had to do miracles that he just, there's only so many hours in the day, right? I mean, Jesus still was human and had to go to bed, he had to sleep, and he had to rest. Today we're going to uh, hear about a miracle about Jesus walking on water. This uh, is actually found not only in Matthew, but in Mark and also in John. So it's found in uh, those three Gospels, but the one we're going to look at is from Matthew chapter 14. But let's look at the opening paragraph here. It says, Our gracious God has given us a beautiful planet on which to live, filling it with wonders and pleasures to delight us. Many people enjoy recreation in the great outdoors, but it doesn't take long to learn that we are not in control of nature. We imagine that we can handle any situation, but a change of weather or an unexpected event can catch us off guard. Suddenly we can find ourselves overwhelmed, facing danger. Have you ever found yourself facing danger as a result of nature? And how did it feel and what did you do? Took cover. Took cover from, from the rain. The rain, yeah. okay. Yeah. Or in this case, the wind that we've been having. It was very windy up in Overland Park, I guess. Was it very windy yes, here as well? Very windy. I don't know if the weather changes a couple hours north or south, but yeah, it was pretty windy up there too. Rained a little bit. Anybody else? I drove from St. Louis to Florida with four of our five kids by myself. <laughs> and there was a horrible, horrible rainstorm that was so bad I had I couldn't keep I was in seminary taking classes. She didn't leave me and then come back. So now I have to quantify everything that so this when Jennifer and I are separated. So this leaving used kind of a reality <laughs> thing. <laughs> she took all four kids. I was like. <laughs> I was in summer Greek, so I was in school five hours a day, five days a week. Plus I had five hours of homework every night. Yeah. So it was uh, a lot. But I really wasn't able to pay much attention, so she decided her parents were living in Florida at the time, so she spent a good amount of time there. I had a little bit of rain last night coming home on the 35, and it got so bad. I mean, I was driving 70 because it was, that was the speed limit, and then all of a sudden it got so bad, I, I didn't go down to 30. I couldn't see. But that's not my experience. Anybody else have? Please. Well, it's our basement is 
for a seller and more than once the whistle was blown and we thought that was gonna rock and we rushed to the church station and done that several times. Okay. One time came home and found damage. I mean not in my place but in the neighborhood. Okay. So tornadoes are obviously a natural thing around here, right? What I've heard? Yeah. <laughs> you want to hear my experience with nature? Yes. Yeah. I, uh, I like to go surfing. And so um, surfing is what I kind of grew up doing. And I love being in the ocean and I love the water. But you have to be careful because well, if you've ever been swimming in the ocean, uh, there are rip currents. There are currents that pull you out from the shore. Um, and so been swimming since I was five or six, feel like I'm a pretty strong swimmer, and I felt always comfortable in the ocean, until one day I didn't. We were living in Seattle, Washington, and so I took all my surfing stuff up to Seattle, Washington with me, and one time, Jennifer and I went to Cannon Beach, Oregon. Cannon Beach is just a little south of Astoria, to the very northern tip of Oregon, right before you get to Washington, and there's a big place called Haystack Rock, if you've ever seen a picture of it. You could Google Haystack Rock and see it. it's a giant thing. And so I decided, hey, I want to go surfing in Oregon. I'd never surfed Oregon. It was cold. Water's always cold, not much about 50 or 55 up in the Northwest to go surfing in the middle of summer. Had a full wetsuit on, big, I have a nine foot six surfboard. I felt that was doing pretty good until I wasn't. I was sitting on top of this surfboard and I could feel the current taking me out farther than what I got comfortable. And when you get into a rip current, if you know how to fight that, you, you swim Sorry. parallel with the shore Sorry. to get out of it and come down, but it wasn't working. Then this, if you ever take a look, I wish I had a visual, but this haystack rock, I got swept behind it. So I was in my, on my surfboard getting pulled out into the sea behind this giant rock where I could not see the land. And I, I was able to actually swim around it, but I got so deep, I was starting to panic. I was wearing a wetsuit, which is a flotation. It, was, it would keep me afloat, and I had a surfboard. But I got to the point where I was like, I could just float out to sea. Who's going to see me? Because there were no lifeguards. So I was a little scared. I was a lot scared, I'm not going to lie. Luckily, the, I didn't cry. I could have very easily because <laughs> my face was already wet and no one would have noticed. But I was, you know, I'm supposed to cry in the shower so people don't see it. Yeah. Anyway, um, so I go behind this rock, and I, at that point, I had always respected the ocean and knew how much power it had. But at that point, I felt helpless, and I began to panic a little. Took some breaths. Do you see how big it is? I don't know the actual dimensions of it, but. Um, it's huge. And so I got swept behind it. Long story short, obviously I made it. I had to swim all the way around it. I was able to paddle into shore. My heart was... <laughs> I told this story to my wife. I'm sure my face was white as a sheet. But it was at that point where I felt like I didn't have any control. What was I going to do? I felt like there was something that was going to happen to me and it was out of my control. Yeah. How did I feel? Hopeless. I panicked. What did I do? I had to breathe and get myself out of that situation. Did it stop me from ever going back in the ocean? No. Stop me from ever surfing in Oregon again, I'll tell you that much. But I was nervous. I was scared. I was hopeless. I didn't know what to do. And, oh, you, you betcha. As I'm paddling, Lord, help me now. Lord, save me. I couldn't hold my hands because I, I needed to go. And I just asked for strength to get around. And obviously the good Lord took care of me. But for just a second there, you feel helpless. Like, what, how are you going to get out of it? And so, for me, uh, nature has always, uh, I, I, you don't mess with it. Because it's something you can't control. Right. And of course, as humans, we want to be able to control everything that happens to us. I mean, I've been out on boats, as this, the story is going to kind of tell us. And, but I've never felt like I was in big trouble, except for I was in an aluminum boat once with my brother, and it started to rain, and then lightning started to strike, so we actually motored the beach and got off on the lake because we didn't want to be with graphite fishing poles and a metal boat with lightning. It's not a good yeah. combination. <laughs> it's like playing golf and lightning. No, it's not a good idea. I'm going to leave my graphite golf club in the air. But you panic. And you wonder, God, please save me. Um, so that's my experience. And it was, it was scary. 
<laughs> it just brings it all back. I don't know about you. When you think yeah. about things that have happened, it just kind of... Yeah. So anyways. Did Jennifer, was she on, Jennifer on shore? Watching no, she was in the hotel room, I believe, oh. which was... It, it was on the beach, so you could see out, but... Um, no, I'll go by myself. There was nobody else out there either. I've surfed by myself, but I always felt like I was careful enough that I could at least stand up or not be too far, but all of a sudden it just hit me. I was like, and I was gone. Surfing by yourself is not a good idea in case something happens. I've had more than one little accident of surfing, but it just comes kind of the territory for those who ride dirt bikes or those who use water ski or those, whatever you kind of do, you, you run the risk of getting hurt. But nature is what scared the bejesus out of me, for lack of a better way of putting it. Yeah. Well, all right. Anybody else got a good story like mine? All right, fine. Well, you can hear mine then. Okay. Let's just read the whole thing all the way through once. Would someone like to do that? 22 to 36? Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And being beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. And when they had crossed over, they came to land on Gennesaret. Is that it? Uh, 36, oh. please. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent around to all that region and brought to him all who were sick and implored them that they might only touch the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. Thank you. Heard this miracle before? Yes. Anything strike you as interesting? I like first impressions. Or something you... I think sometimes he speaks first and maybe thinks later. Has some foot and mouth disease? Yeah. My foot and mouth says Peter was impetuous. He started out with a lot of faith, but he lost it on the way down. Yeah. What am I doing? I'm pretty pumped up with old Jesus out there, right? Yeah. Anything else? I think those disciples were many times surprised at what Jesus did. And walking on the water wasn't something that they had ever expected to see him do. And then the end of the verses, they worshiped him. They realized, I mean, just another thing for us to know Jesus is God. What had happened just prior to this was that Jesus had just fed the 5,000 uh, men and plus women and children. You can imagine how much stress that took out of him and the amount of people that he had just been, his, his popularity of his earthly ministry is just getting bigger and bigger. So the crowds of people are, are just continuing to flock to him. Right? And so in verses 22 to 24, um, what does Jesus do after the miracle? He sends the disciples. He says, disciples, get in this boat and 
you go. Go on out into the lake, right? While he dismissed the crowds. Where did he go then? He went on the mountain to pray. Right. Even Jesus had to get away. Even Jesus, through all the stuff that he does, being both God and man, needed time away to pray. And it's interesting that he goes up onto a mountain. Um, I don't know the significance of it being a mountain, except for maybe people couldn't see him there, or maybe they wouldn't climb up the mountain, but you'd think if they got that important or that excited, or people were that excited to see him, they would follow him anywhere, but at other times he just kind of disappears, right? He just goes where he needs to go. At the LWML convention, um, when you sit into a room, which is a we went to a beautiful savior in Olathe, and they had just built a brand new fellowship hall type place where we had our worship. It's a gotta be a metal building with a cement floor. I think they had just finished it. Like I said, there were about 400 people in there. And the organ was playing, and they had a choir, and handbells, and the closing song was A Mighty Fortress. There were like 14 pastors in there, and it was just this great experience. You and I would call a mountaintop experience. Yeah. You call, uh, when I used to do youth retreats, we just went, we went to the mountains just up about an hour or so from where we lived, and we spend a weekend in a cabin and do Bible study and play games and stay up and have a good time. And it, it really gives you this feeling that you don't want to leave. You think about these ladies that are going to have to go back to their churches now after spending all this time together, uh, both in the little workshops and in their rooms and just visiting, and then all of a sudden everybody has to now leave and go back to their churches. And sometimes it's a downer. You get low because you, you lose that mountaintop retreat experience. But for Jesus, he just needs some quiet rest time on his own because he knows what's coming his way. He knows that his job is nowhere near done. But at this point, he needs to let the disciples kind of do their thing. He goes up the mountain to pray, to rest, and to worship. Always good, right, and salutary stuff that we should do. Take time away to just talk to God. What is the definition of prayer? Anybody can tell me? You remember your catechism days? Well, I could have used you last Wednesday. We're talking about prayer as speaking to God in words and thoughts, as Martin Luther defines what prayer is. Right, I told you I couldn't pray while I was trying to save my own life, you know, paddling on a surfboard. I could not fold my hands and close my eyes. I could have, but then I may have panicked. Anybody prayed in the car? Yeah. Do you fold your hands and close your eyes? Please don't while you're driving. <laughs> not a good idea. Just need to speak to God. You need to tell him, hey, I'm having an issue, or hey, I love you, thank you, however your prayers go. And you wonder, what is Jesus praying? What does it tell us? It doesn't really matter, but the example of just getting away, even Jesus himself, just needed to take some time. But as Jesus is gone, then the disciples find themselves in a crisis. What happened? It's in verses 22 to 24. What happened to the disciples? Remember, they're in the boat in the oh. middle of the lake, which is about three to three and a half miles from shore, by the way. If you're a visual person, you're thinking the size of this lake and how far are they? Three and a half miles away. Remember, they did not have a motor outside of these, right? Or a sail and a, yeah. right? Whatever this is. That's a rudder. Thank you, to steer. <laughs> a rudder, thank you. I couldn't come up with the word. Yeah. I told you, it was a late night. And I yeah. I got a rudder motion. to steer, right? What happened? They see the storm. The wind yeah. started to blow. The waves started to crash over the side of the boat. And they panicked. But they were professional fishermen. Many of them were. So what does that tell you about this storm? 
There's some magic in there. But it doesn't say anywhere in here that they were fearful of a storm at all. And being experienced fishermen, or if you go out with somebody who says they are, you put your confidence in them no matter what is going on around you. Uh, you know, it wow, wasn't until they see Jesus that they panic. And it doesn't make sense to me why you would, you know, cry out in fear. If you've got a ghost, let them go. Yeah. You know, don't let them know you're there. I'm sorry, I'm human. I mean, what does the ghost want? It doesn't say that. It just says they saw me. They saw something what frightened. Was this was between 3 and 6 in the morning, so obviously they had a very long day. They've been in this boat. The storm comes up, right? It was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And the fourth watch of the night, which is somewhere between 3 in the morning and 6 in the morning, the disciples see something frightening. What terrifies them? Why are they scared? Oh, there's a human, looks like, walking on the water. Right. A little abnormal for the time. <laughs> right? You guys been fishing on Friday? Did you see anybody walk on the water? No? Even Scott doesn't walk on the water. That's right. <laughs> you didn't even get a miracle catch of fish either, no. from what I understand. <laughs> <laughs> it was a tough day. <laughs> but you went fishing. Place. We got home safe. But you went fishing. Yeah. Sometimes fish, bad days fishing better than a good day working. Is that how right. that bumper sticker goes? Yes. Well, we would agree. There you go. At least you got a chance to get out there. Uh, by the way, we're on question number three on your paper. I haven't really gone down the list, but I am as I'm kind of talking about it. Uh, what terrifies them? Jesus is walking on the water. They had never seen that before. <laughs> Neither Without the help of Hollywood, neither have we. Yeah. Right? Three to six in the morning. Mm -hmm. You've got to think maybe they're on and off sleeping, taking turns. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Groggy. Yeah. Do you see what I see? Yeah. Eyeballs are like. <laughs> you know what else floors me about Bible times is they didn't wear glasses. Does this seem random to you or just, you know, for me it's like, did everybody just have perfect vision or you just live with it? You just see what you can see. Right? <laughs> so my, my point is maybe some of them didn't have the best vision and couldn't really tell what it was. These are my windshield wipers from my eyeglasses. <laughs> I don't know why, but I am ADD, so in case you know that about me, things just pop in my head and sometimes they come out of my mouth. I try not to have foot and mouth disease, but it is relative to the story of people trying to see Jesus. What terrifies them is Jesus walking on water, but what then comforts them? Jesus also scares me. I have no idea. I can't explain what's going on. Remember, it's a miracle. Jesus is walking on top of the water. He says, take courage. This is wonderful. Take heart. It is I. Yeah. Do not be afraid. No. Okay, I'm not afraid. <laughs> Just like that. Right? They were still starving. Oh, tell me. You yes, have a question. <laughs> yes, sir. Is there uh, any time that Jesus was tired from doing these miracles or they were just spoken to happen. Did he get tired from that? Uh, is, is there any where it shows that he had to go somewhere and take a rest? Yes, a lot of times. For his body himself. There's also the story of Jesus in the boat with the disciples. Or sleeping. And he's in the back of the boat asleep. I love that story. Because you think of the disciples in the boat saying, hey, who's going to wake up Jesus? I'm not going to be that guy. You do it. I'm not going to wake him up. He's asleep in the back. Yes. He gets a way to pray. He gets a way to rest because he is a, a that helps us see him as uh, being a man also as well as God. 
his body needed to rest. Now, could he have just upped his God power and pushed through it? Of course he could. But he didn't at certain certain points. You know that one story about the woman that touched his garment and he said he felt the power go out of him? Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. He knew what was going on. Yeah. He didn't say he was short of power. No. He wasn't missing it. He just wasn't like missing it. He just knew it was. That's how we kind of explain him being both God and man, right? He brings up the God power and pushes down the man power and kind of back and forth. Mm-hmm. As he, uh, we use humiliation and exaltation from the catechism. We use those terms to describe it. It's kind of hard for us to seriously comprehend it. Because at any time, he could just be God and never have to sleep, I would imagine, or be able to do anything he wanted to and however that happened. But if you look at it as uh, God using Jesus to help people understand exactly who he is, and help people understand who God the Father is as well through the things that Jesus is doing. The thing that I think comforts the disciples is they realize it's not a ghost. It's Jesus. He's been spending quite a bit of time with them. Maybe he called them out and he's um, hanging out with them. And so I think just seeing him, and by the way, what did we see? We've seen a uh, healing of the 5,000. We've seen a man with a withered hand. We've seen many, many miracles of Jesus. He tells them not to have any fear. He tells some parables. These things, they're kind of, Jesus has been revealing himself to them bit by bit. But as you and I both know, we still look at them and say, well, why didn't you get it? But put yourself in their sandals and where would we have been sitting at that point? I don't know. It would have been just like the ministry of this. Early. Well, I don't know the year. We know that Jesus had about a three-year um, earthly ministry. He had just called the 12 apostles not long after that. He calls, heals the leper. I, I don't know. Do you know the timeline? Would you guess? He does not have his synopsis, so we don't know. I would guess about a year or so, in maybe. I don't know. I was just kind of wondering. Yeah. If the disciples really comprehended that it was God. God was with them. I think they. I think they did, but I think they're constantly surprised at some of the stuff he did, because they'd had enough miracles before that they knew he was God. Getting the, at least they're getting the gist of who he is. I mean, Please. Well, I think that Peter's uh, stated to him, Lord, if, if you let me come on the water to you, hey, I don't think he's going to. Peter was no dummy. No. You know, he kind of flew with Caesar's pants sometimes, I think. But he, he said to him, if it's you, then let me come to you on the water. And he started out, and as long as he kept his eyes on, and as long as he knew that Jesus was right there, he was fine. And so I think that Jesus um, knew what he knew what needed to be done. Sure. And so I doubt that Peter ever tried to walk on the water again. <laughs> I mean, we don't know for sure. In the water, okay, in the water. I probably did try to walk. Sure. <laughs> oh, I, it's yeah. You wonder how those and what are the other disciples thinking yeah. when well, Jesus says, "Yeah, they didn't follow him." <laughs> <laughs> hey, me too. Me too. Let's go hands and walk with Jesus on top of the water. <laughs> Did it really happen? Was this before or after he come to see? Oh. You're asking all the great Terry, questions. Come on. <laughs> um, I don't know that either. I should be more prepared. Well, in the book of Matthew doesn't give us that one, so I'd have to go back and look at I'd have to compare the other gospels to find out. Verse 32. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. 
But there was a, another time. Oh, he's talking about the time when Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat. Uh, I don't remember the timeline if this was before the walking on water or after. Well, you got to believe at this point he's still pretty popular, so it's probably pretty early in his ministry. There you go. So my educated guess, his educated guess is no, it hasn't happened yet. Or maybe it did. Either way, I, why are you asking? Yeah, there you go. You know, I thought the disciples would have been saying, hey, he can calm the sea. That's, yeah. that's where I thought you were heading. That's where I thought you were going, because it makes logical sense. If Either way you look at it, though. Yes, Joseph? There was an activity. Did you Google it? Nope. Oh. I looked it up in the Bible. Oh, in the New Testament? Yes. Did he Google you? That's where... Jesus calms the storm. So he had already done that. Why are you afraid of you have little faith? I'm going to sit down over here. You want to? Want to? Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you. Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm, and the men marveled, saying, what sort of man is this? They didn't really get it. Well, you could have Googled it. You Google everything. So. Yeah. <laughs> so to answer your question, Jesus had already calmed the storm. Maybe when they saw that it was Jesus, they weren't so worried anymore. Yeah. Oh, this but what did pastors say? What were they really freaked out about? Was it the storm? There was this dude walking yes. on the water. Yeah. That was really their issue because yeah. obviously they had had the storm been calmed by Jesus. And I'll bet you they had been in storms before. Sure. <laughs> but this was a ghostly encounter that kind of freaked them out, evidently. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that's why Peter asked if he could go too, because he knew he could with Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Seeing Jesus, we're in verses 28 to 31, if you're following down the outline with me. Peter takes what bold action? Lord, if it is you, command <laughs> Come what on kind now. of inflection do you want to put on that? Mm. <laughs> Prove it, Jesus. If you really are God, that's how I read it, but that's not how he says it. Command me to come to you on the water. <laughs> it is you, not some weirdo ghost at 3 o'clock in the morning. We can't figure it out. Why don't you invite me out? I'd love to come walk on the water with you. Is he doesn't he just step out of the boat. Is he trying to make sure that it's Jesus? <laughs> yeah. If it really is question. you, you get my eyes a little fuzzy at three in the morning or four in the morning. Is it really you, God, Jesus? Then, then invite me out. How do you take that? Oh. He's drunk with tiredness. <laughs> drunk with tiredness. Okay. It doesn't say he easily stepped out of the boat to test the water. It says he got out and started yeah. walking. I wonder how far he was from the boat. Yeah, I wonder. Where was he? Where was he at first? But Jesus replies with, come. He does invite him out. He could have said, stop, stay in the boat. I'm good. I'm just going to take a little walk to you to the other side. You all just keep on doing what you're doing. He said, come. So he answers Peter's request to command him to come. And that was a miracle too for, for Peter to be walking on the water. He had no power. Got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came to Jesus. My Bible, the footnote says it could have also meant since it is you. Oh. That sounds nicer than what I thought of. Yeah. What, what did you say? Since it is you, not if it is you. Yeah, my English standard version comes out as if it is you. Another version, I have to look at the Greek, I could have done, but I didn't. Could have given us a better feeling for, well, since it is you. Sounds a lot nicer yeah. than prove it to me, Jesus. But either way, Peter still opens his mouth and decides that he is going to be the one to walk on water. To, to, to test it. 
Now, is that blind faith or is it just, I am going to do this? I know it's you. My faith is in you. I am going to step out of the boat. Yeah. Blind faith, but it also builds trust. 100% trust. Hey, I never walked on water before. Why don't I give it a try? All kinds of things. Bless you. I read a book well, once called You Can't Walk on Water Unless You Step Out of the Boat by John Portman. Um, if you, you can't walk on water unless you step out of the boat. The whole premise is um, you have to basically take chances and risks, 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 risks in life. Uh, if you just sit in a boat the whole time and you're so comfortable, then you may not be able to experience what God has given you fully. It's kind of the synopsis of the book. But his thing is, you know, sometimes we take chances. Sometimes we take risks. Knowing that with God in front of us or with us, he's going to be with us through those things. Um, I did a whole retreat on that one time at the beach. Before he gets to Jesus, something happens. What's that? And he takes his eyes off of Jesus. He starts to realize... I'm walking on water. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, yeah, the other thing is what? Just calm, smooth water. Yeah. It didn't, it hasn't yet, right? It hasn't <laughs> said anything about that. He steps out, eyes focused on Jesus, and he starts to walk. It's a great place to stop, don't you think? I bet it was a good story around his campfire. Uh, oh, my <laughs> Oh, that is perfect. Thank you, God. <laughs> Nine twelve. I knew what that kind of That's funny. Uh, next time, we'll start here. <laughs> Verses 28 to 31. You can keep your paper, put your name on it. If you want to put it back on the stool, I'll take it with me. But we'll continue our discussion on Jesus walking on water and how Peter steps out of the boat. Let's pray. We thank you, dear God, for the faith that we see in Peter. We thank you that even though we don't necessarily always see Jesus right in front of us. We know that he is here with us, uh, caring for us and loving us through it all. We ask that you help us keep that faith and our eyes continue to be focused on him. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody. So I don't know if there's any way of just shutting off the audio. I, I'm going to have to shut it completely down. Right? Uh, I'm just going to shut it down.